Welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining us here tonight. We as the Swiss Society are very proud to be able to host this speaker event together with Calypso Nicolaides, Niklaus Nuschwige and Alexis Lautenberg centered around the big question of the relation of the UK and Switzerland to the EU. In a moment, I will hand it over to Annalina for an introduction. However, in the meantime, if you would like to stay updated on our next events and especially speaker events, please visit our webpage, oxfordswisssociety.com or like our Facebook page. Thank you very much. And Annalina, please take it away. I see um, with the title Beyond Cherry Picking, the future of the UK's and Switzerland relationship with the EU. Um, and I think it couldn't be a better timing um, to discuss this topic. Uh, for those who followed a bit the news, um, it became fairly obvious uh, after last week's turbulences in both Switzerland and the UK that the challenge of how to build sustainable and mutually beneficial relations with the EU has definitely um, not diminished uh, quite, quite the contrary. Um, at the same time that the clock is ticking um, and decisions will have to be taken soon. And so Switzerland and the UK share this moment of, of a critical juncture about their relation to the EU. And with that, maybe also a question of, of what sovereignty means to them um, in, in today's context. And uh, Lord Peter Ricketts, um, who is a crossbench in the House of Lords, um, he called it the biggest moment of strategic change since 1945 in, in Europe. And whether one agrees or not with this, I would say very uh, dramatic picture, um, I think we need, we need to be aware that the decisions taken in the next couple of months will not only shape the design of these relationships in legal terms and then just until 2022 20, maybe, uh, but it also shapes the, the European experience. Um, it shapes what it means in, in practical and maybe also symbolical ways to be British, Swiss um, and, and European. Um, and, and I would say it lays the base for, for the future, uh, for our future students, uh, for our future international people, and the future maybe also of the upcoming generation as citizens of, of Europe in some or, or the other way. And so I think this just stresses the, the importance of exchanges like today on the, on the current challenges, but also on the opportunities of this critical juncture and of this future, future relationships. Um, and I'm more, more than happy, and I think we could not wish for better experts than we have here today to discuss these questions. And so I would like to welcome Calypso Nicolaides first, um, who is a, a professor for international relations here in Oxford. And uh, I don't know if you, Calypso, uh, sleep at all. Uh, I'm wondering sometimes. Uh, you must know she's not only the absolute EU and Brexit expert here um, and thus attends a lot of discussions and has a lot of projects going on, uh, but also teaches with great passion. Uh, she has worked with numerous EU institutions uh, on policy projects and published also a new book last year um, that is called Exodus, Reckoning, Sacrifice, Three Meanings of Brexit, uh, where she very skillfully explores uh, the competing visions that have clashed over the meaning of Brexit. So welcome, uh, Calypso. I would also like to warmly welcome Alexis Lautenberg, uh, who joins us from Switzerland. Um, Mr. Lautenberg is a long service Swiss diplomat who represents Switzerland, represented Switzerland as an ambassador at, at the most important posts in Europe, uh, such as London, for example. Um, but importantly for us, he was the Swiss ambassador to the EU between 1993 and 1999. Um, and you must know this was a very delicate phase uh, since it was just after the Swiss rejection to join the European uh, economic area in 1992. And so, he and, and together with his colleagues, they were in this, in this situation of a mission impossible to form agreements that could be supported by all sides in a very deeply divided setting um, of Swiss politics on the question of, of Europe. So welcome Alexis Lautenberg, uh, great to have you uh, with us today. Thank you. And um, last but definitely not least, I very, very warmly wel welcome uh, Niklaus Nussbliger 
who currently is the political correspondent for the Swiss Daily Neue Zürcher Zeitung in London. And before coming to the UK, he was the political correspondent in Brussels um, and published a book about his observations and analysis of the European democracy crisis and also possible ways out of it. Um, and the book is called Europe Between Populist Dictatorship and Bureaucratic Rule. It's a fantastic book. I can only recommend it. And luckily for us, uh, he does brilliantly knows the discourses and the challenges and opportunities of this triangle like the back um, of, of his hand. Um, and with that hand, maybe uh, I will hand over to you, Niklaus. Uh, you're providing us with some food for thought first and then leading us through this discussion, uh, first in form of the panel and then open up to everyone. Um, so many, many thanks for that, Niklaus. Thank you very much, Annalina, for this uh, extremely kind introduction. And um, also uh, good evening and welcome from my side here in London. Uh, thank you so much also to the uh, Oxford, the Swiss Society for hosting this event and for having me as a moderator. Um, as Annalina said, I've re only recently moved to the UK here during this pandemic, which is, uh, as you can imagine, uh, a challenging uh, moment to move internationally. And before that, I was in, uh, in Brussels uh, for over six years, obviously, working already there on Brexit and also on Swiss-EU relations. And um, as Annalina said, it is a very timely moment for uh, this debate, of course, even though I also have to say over the last year, we often thought, you know, like the, 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 the Swiss-EU relations are at a critical juncture or like a Brexit, this is the decisive moment. But this time it actually seems to be <laughs> true because, at the, uh, because uh, in any case, in the British case, uh, there is a, uh, the clock is actually ticking and at the end of this year, uh, the uh, transition period will come to an end. Um, and uh, at the same time, as you've already said, in Switzerland, we had like this vote recently um, on, and the Swiss people rejected a new initiative of the uh, Swiss People's Party, this uh, populist right-wing party that wanted to terminate effectively free movement of people and also this bilateral setting. Um, uh, the set of uh, bilateral uh, agreements that Switzerland has with the European Union. This uh, initiative was rejected. Now we have again this discussion on the institutional framework agreement. Uh, the Swiss government, I believe, will in the next weeks decide how to move that file forward, to go back to Brussels, re-engage or possibly even renegotiate um, uh, that uh, institutional framework um, agreement we will see. But before we go into more detail on the state of play and the meaning of these uh, negotiations and uh, the Swiss EU and UK EU relations, I would maybe very quickly offer a, a few observations that I uh, made over the last years uh, as, a, as a journalist. And uh, when I got to Brussels at the end of 2013, it was uh, from coming from New York from a previous posting then, I thought, because reading a bit like the Swiss press, you have the impression there are so many people in Brussels who day in and day out uh, have nothing else to do than kind of looking for ways to punish uh, the Swiss. But then to my astonishment, I realized that at the time there were only like maybe a dozen of people on the EU side who really kind of knew the, the, the Swiss EU file. And it was a very kind of a niche beat, you know, if you wanted to cover Swiss EU relations. And then this slowly started to change during my time in Brussels. First, the first event was obviously in 2014, uh, where the Swiss voted uh, for the first time, uh, at, uh, and this time in favor uh, of an initiative uh, against mass immigration, which also kind of put into question the bilateral agreements and namely the free movement agreement with the European Union. And all of a sudden, like Switzerland was center stage, Swiss EU relations were center stage, like the uh, colleagues, journalists from different countries started asking me what is going on. And before that, they were actually quite happy if they didn't have to touch Swiss EU uh, relations because it was so complicated. 
And it will not be a surprise to you that namely the, Swiss, the, the British colleagues were very interested in what was happening. And that was maybe already um, um, a kind of a prelude to what happened in 2016, Brexit vote. And that's when um, the interest in the Swiss model, so to speak, really um, increased in Brussels. Um, and uh, British colleagues started to go into the details. And that's maybe one of the a point that I would make if it, that Britain is realizing or started to realize after that Brexit vote, if you want to have a relationship outside of the EU, it's going to be messy and it's going to be complicated. And not only did the number of British journalists increase in Brussels after they decided to leave, but also, uh, in my opinion, the quality of the reporting uh, increased. And for example, we always say in Switzerland, you know, you can have, you can outsource correspondence um, for Swiss newspapers to German, to, to, to colleagues who work for German newspapers in many locations in Latin America, Africa. It might not be so important that you have somebody who is actually familiar with Swiss politics, but in Brussels, it is actually the case. And I think like this is something very similar now happening uh, in the UK. You try to go away from the EU, but at the same time, the EU becomes more important and uh, you, have to, uh, you have to kind of engage in a, in a very different way. And then secondly, maybe I would argue that Brexit somehow created a politi political menage à trois um, between Switzerland, the UK and um, uh, the European Union or, or Brussels. And all of a sudden people in, in London were starting to look very closely at what the Swiss were negotiating in this institutional framework agreement. Um, and in, in, in Switzerland, like um, politicians were looking into these Brexit negotiations, always hoping that maybe the strong Brits would be able to get a deal that might ultimately also be beneficial for the Swiss. Um, and of course, like the officials in the commission also became very much aware of these uh, political links. Of course, on the record, they would tell us journalists always, you know, these files are completely separate. There are no links, but off the record, everybody acknowledged that uh, both files were politically linked. And this probably made also things much more difficult for the Swiss. And so if you start wondering, and that's maybe my final point, why these uh, files are politically linked. I would say that Switzerland and the UK probably face a similar trade-off. Uh, they also have like maybe, or you could find similar narratives uh, in the uh, public debate, Eurosceptic narratives. Maybe that's something we can come back to in the discussion. But both governments also adopt very different strategies when dealing with uh, the UK. The trade-off is basically, you know, you want to maximize your economic access or your economic benefit, the access to the European market, while uh, at the same time also minimize the loss of sovereignty or maintain a high degree of national uh, democratic decision-making power. Um, but um, then, of course, if you talk to people who are involved in negotiations in the UK now, they also say, well, you know, the Swiss made a very different choice. They're staying in parts of the single market. I think we will get into that in more details. So um, maybe uh, the, the parallels are de facto increasingly less important, the more distant the relationship is that the UK is seeking with the European Union. But one thing that I uh, always thought was remarkable as a journalist is like when you look at the, how the Brits and how the Swiss negotiate with the EU, uh, I mean, in the UK, if you, if you only look at, at the last weeks and months, there was so much uh, theatrics. There was a very bold approach with threats and ultimatums. There was this row over the single market bill. And the Swiss always have a very different approach. They, in a way, try to be clever. They try to buy time, postpone things. Uh, for example, this institutional framework agreement was already adopted uh, in at the end of 2018, so more than uh, adopted, negotiated uh, more than two, two years ago. The Swiss tried to fly uh, a bit under the radar, maybe so to speak. And so I sometimes hear voices here in the UK who say, well, how did the Swiss manage to be so clever and to kind of, you know, 
uh, get the deal that they did get in the end? How was it possible? But at the same time, I get a lot of feedback also from readers uh, in, in Switzerland when we do report that Neue Zürcher Zeitung uh, about Brexit. And they say, we would need a man like Boris Johnson who goes to Brussels and tells, the, tells uh, these unelected uh, Brussels bureaucrats, you know, how uh, we're going to walk away from the negotiations. And so uh, I feel there's like, in a way, admiration on both sides for the other's approach. We will see, I guess, in the coming weeks uh, and months, which approach and which country will be in what way successful in these negotiations. Um, but before that, I think I would like to now uh, enter the actual panel discussion and welcome Ambassador Lautenberg and uh, uh, Professor Calypso Nikolaidis um, um, here also from my side on, on Zoom. And we said we're going to structure this discussion maybe into three parts. Uh, the first might maybe be what are the main challenges in the design of uh, the EU-UK and the Swiss-UK relationships. Um, then we would maybe look at the similarities between these two approaches and these two negotiation files, maybe also into the differences. Um, and then um, at the end, maybe kind of look more into the future. What would be an optimal outcome if we try to maybe abstract from the current role, uh, from the, on the, uh, abstract from the current difficulties of the negotiations? Where would we want these relationships to be in let's maybe say 10 years? And maybe I would like to uh, start with you, uh, uh, Alexis Lautenberg, uh, if you could uh, maybe bring us a little bit up to speed and tell us about, you know, the main challenges in the design of the Swiss EU relationships. What are the issues? What are the problems with these with this institutional framework agreement? And why, in a way, are the current uh, bilateral relations that we have not good enough? Yeah. Good. Good evening. And um, first of all, I'd like to. Thank Anna and Alina for having involved me. I'm looking forward to this, discu this discussion um, with uh, Calypso, with, uh, with Niklaus and with the, all the participants um, in, this, in, in this Zoom. Um, well, I, I, I would maybe start um, with the beginning, that is the day after the famous rejection by the Swiss people of the participation in the EEA agreement. Um, because already there, um, you, you see, you'd probably see the, the big difference between Switzerland then and the UK now. Um, I mean, the, 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 key, the key feature then, and that we were sent to Brussels within months or weeks or months after that vote, um, the, the, it was that the Swiss didn't have a position um, I mean, the, the, the government didn't have a position, the parliament didn't have a position, and the, the public was deeply divided. I mean, there were some people who said we should have a second vote on the EA, um, and one has to add also, because the margin of that vote was absolutely minimal. Um, there was a second category of people who said, uh, but all this is blunder. Um, we should, um, as the, most of the other EFTA countries, join the, the EU and stop with these gray zone dealings which lead nowhere. And then the third category um, would say we, we, we don't need anything. Um, there's no need for anything because things are working very well. And during the seven years of the negotiation of the first uh, package, um, basically we were confronted on the internal front. I mean, I'm speaking now uh, from a point of view of the, the, of the diplomat or the negotiator, um, we, we didn't have a clear position. Now, this is very different from um, today's position of the EU, although um, I was in London um, the, 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 on that famous uh, night, 23rd and 24th of June uh, 2016, uh, it, it, was, it was interesting because you, you really had very, very different reactions about how to go about it. But of course, in the course of the, uh, of the years, things have 
changed. I mean, we did succeed in uh, getting through and voting three times on different bits and pieces of that first package of seven agreements. So the, this type of relation has become more legitimate in a way in the, in, the, in the public. And I guess that up to the present day, although people do tend to put elements of it, in particular the freedom of, of movement in, in, in question, I think there is a relatively solid majority to try to preserve what is there. Um, then other elements came into the into the into the game, in particular the participation in, in Schengen. Another element where the, the Swiss, in a certain way, were were more um, or are more advanced now that uh, the UK uh, when they, when when they were still in the European Union, um, and in a certain way, uh, the fact that the European Union years later um, tried to put pressure on Switzerland uh, for them to accept a framework uh, institutional agreement. Um, I mean, I didn't like the way in which it was done, but basically the union was right because the way in which we negotiated these first seven plus other agreements in the following years was really um, very, very, very complicated. And every, every one of these agreements had a different legal status with different dispute settlement system with different uh, man ways to, 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 to manage them. So, I mean, there was a, a, certain, a certain logic in trying to establish a, a framework, uh, an approach that I recognize also in the reaction of the European Union to the, um, to, into, in, 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 the Brexit, in the Brexit field. Now, where do we, where do we stand uh, now, um, I mean, the Swiss have been under pressure for a long time now, and uh, they underwent this negotiation. The negotiators agreed on a on a on a, on, a, on a text, uh, but the but the country again was rather dis was rather divided, and the the government was divided, and Parliament was divided um, on whether one should accept this type of a framework agreement. And basically, I, if, if I really put it down to the, to the bottom line of the, whole, of the whole thing, it's not so much uh, the, the fact that one tries to, to develop a, a closer institutional and contractual relation. It's more the way in which this th whole thing is laid out, it is being managed. And then there is one very important point, and I'll stop after that one because this was, leads us directly to the position of the of the of the UK. I mean, the Swiss have succeeded in mixing in different agreements different types of participation in the single market. Uh, we have a string of agreements where we participate entirely uh, in, the, in the in in the single market, and others where we are not. And the, the delicacy and the, 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 the challenging part of the managing of, the, the, of, the, of these negotiations now is how do you fit into a same framework agreements, present and future ones, that have a very, very different nature from an institutional point of view. I mean, I just stop here by saying, basically, uh, this, this framework agreement was launched simply with the with the agreement the, 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 if the Swiss want to have a continued full market access they have to accept the, the de further development of that of that legislation in that field and they have to accept basically the interpretation uh, a legal interpretation of uh, of these agreements as things go forward and um, there is a, a, a propensity by side, on the side of the European Union to say, well, they have to more or less accept everything we're doing. And this is something where the, the Swiss are quite sensitive and they don't, they don't really know, they don't really like to be, uh, you know, pushed in, pushed in a city. And we, I, to answer your question, Nicholas, I don't know how this is going to go in the, in the nearer future. I honestly, I honestly don't know. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, and maybe I should I'll really finish with that. I'm not sure that the proximity of the British and 
sort of relation and, and, and negotiations of, at this at this phase is really helping us because it is my firm personal view um, that we have even we even if we have tensions on the institutional side I think we have a pretty solid uh, aki in our in our relations in particular. Um, the, the freedom of movement of persons, which is the backbone of the whole thing. And from that point of view, I think we, we, we are basically in a solid position. Thank you so much, um, Alexi. Uh, just very briefly, before I then go over uh, to, the, to the UK side, why, what exa so why exactly, what would happen uh, if the Swiss decided we're just gonna, you know, not adopt like this uh, institutional framework agreement. We just want to remain with the status quo. Can you basically quickly say there's this, this this threat of erosion of the bilateral path? If you can very quickly address that. Yes, um, I think it 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 is easy to describe in a general terms, but then of course it varies enormously in the various sectors. Generally speaking, nothing is going to happen in the short term. Uh, where it will where it will um, really begin to hurt is one agreement um, that I think the Brits should go for, but they haven't, they haven't sort of really gone on it, which is the MRA agreement on goods, the mutual recognition agreement on goods uh, with the union. Um, and this is an area where the, the, the technical and scientific development progresses very, very fast. And if, you, if there is no automatic adaptation, uh, our industry will be, will be um, touched in a very negative, in negative way. But I don't think that this is going to, to happen. I mean, there, there is going to be an agreement. I, I don't have any, any, any doubt. And um, the, the, the EU will have to accept that maybe some of the details have to have to be adapted, but I mean the, the Swiss and a large majority of the Swiss recognize the vital importance of a working uh, and a positive relation between the Swiss and the European Union. All right, thank you so much. So basically, the the status quo that we have enjoyed for now is not an offer anymore, and so that's why we need to in a way to update. Uh, these relations. So maybe if I can turn to uh, Calypso and maybe you could bring us uh, up to speed a bit. Um, uh, where do we stand on the, 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 the EU-UK negotiations? I mean, we're basically now only talking about the quite a skinny free trade agreement. So it's a, a quite a different, uh, so maybe a different re relationship than, than uh, people might have anticipated um, some months or years ago. Um, or even like exiting under WTO terms. So basically a, a no deal, even after obviously there was this, uh, the Brexit agreement already concluded last year. Um, so why is it so challenging in a way uh, for the EU and the UK to find a settlement for their uh, future relationship? You have to unmute yourself. Thank you, Niklas, and wonderful to hear uh, on Ambassador Lottenberg um, on what is going on. And uh, above all, uh, Annalina and all the team, um, great to talk about this magic triangle or wretched triangle, however we want to call it, as Niklas introduced us to. Um, and, and I think that seeing the Brexit negotiation through the angle of the parallel with Switzerland is a, is, is a really fascinating and important exercise, not just for us academics, you know, in our ivory tower, although many of us get very involved in these negotiations, um, but also as you were describing, both of you, because there was a thirst uh, for models uh, and throughout. And uh, uh, one of the fundamental and um, difficulty or tensions in, in, in the Brexit talks has been indeed this back and forth between, of course, we have off the shelf models and no, 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 every negotiation is totally geosyncratic and its own thing. Um, and so that's why I think that, you know, if we look at the Swiss Brexit, Switzerland, Bre Britain 
I, I would, if, if you allow me, Nicholas, to kind of answer your question by going, by comparing with Switzerland, um, or at least perhaps suggesting to us all um, that there are at least three ways in which Britain and Switzerland relate here. Um, on one hand, Switzerland has been a kind of cautionary tale for Britain, right? Um, and to start with the kind of atmospherics, Nicholas, you were just talking about in domestic politics on both sides, um, you were telling us that Swiss was, uh, Switzerland are mu much more under the radar, uh, but still you get this feedback. Still, we got the, the previous vote on free movement that was very sensitive to deal with. Just like in Britain, there is a free movement issue. Um, we are, this is not Norway. We do know that Norway dealt with its EU problem very much by depoliticizing. I don't think you, the Swiss, have quite succeeded in depoliticizing the relationship with the EU. Maybe not as much as some would like in Switzerland. And of course, it's not as politicized as Britain. So we've got a spectrum of politicization, which is it's in itself very interesting. Um, and that negotiators and politicians like Ambassador Lottenberg have to reckon with, right? Um, and I would suggest that the first you know, point is that to this day, the British people as a whole, but as individuals are very ambivalent about the relationship that most people want to take back control, even remainers or keep control. And that's true in Switzerland, that's true in Britain, but also want to cooperate with their big fat neighbor, the EU. So that's a common kind of atmospherics in domestic politics, and it expresses itself at different time in different ways. That's on the country. On the EU side, you've got the, a, a kind of subtle resentment, um, which, you know, Nicholas, you were talking about. The Swiss have heard again and again, we don't want to punish the, Sw the Swiss for not, not loving us, not wanting to be part of us, nor do we want to punish Britain, do we? But I think of thou protest too much. And in fact, we do know that the key, the key challenge for the EU is to make sure that neither Switzerland nor Britain has the advantage of membership. Fair enough, you know, they, they produce in Brussels, um, regional public goods, global public goods, takes a lot of blood and sweat of lots and lots of people taking the Eurostar to go to, and planes to go to Brussels, or these days to be on screens like we are. Um, but they, it's a big investment. So, you know, why should others have access to it? And that is that then comes back to the parallel, because of course, when this whole started, the UK implicitly wanted to be treated like something very special, a very new animal in the international sphere, a former EU member state. We've never had that in the world, right? But what does the EU say? No, you, you're going to be a third country, just like Switzerland. So this question of, and to this day, when you have Barnier just a few, you know, saying again, well, hey guys, you can't be like Canada because you're asking for more than Canada. Yes, they are, and we can come back to this, but because the UK does consider itself as a former member state with all the tie that that implies. So this is, this is the biggest symmetry with Switzerland and the EU wants to push back and say, no, look, we've got a category and it's third country and it's variations on a theme. Um, but of course, the EU then has a further resentment that this time vis-a-vis -vis Switzerland. It's been trying to get rid of this patchwork of a hundred you know, bilateral agreements for many, many years, as Alexi was just telling us. And that's the re renegotiation part one, part two of the agreements. We don't have to get into the detail. And it's been really, really hard. And the Swiss have been a bit, you know, stubborn. How dare you guys, you know, you've, you've been a bit tough. And you're giving a bad example, bad inspiration to the UK uh, because the UK, just like Switzerland, also wanted to have cherry picking, the title of your talk, but what's wrong with cherry picking? We all love to, to pick cherries. We all love to have cake and eat it too. Um, in French, we say avoir le, uh, le beurre et l'argent du beurre et les baisers de la fermière. Uh, that's human. And it's normal that anyone negotiating something in the international system, as I teach my students, will try to have the best of many worlds, 
And we all do that too, you know, when you relate to your kids, to your parents, your friends, you know, that's what you want, it's human. So for Switzerland wants that, the UK wants that, and the EU is trying to, to, to create some boxes because the EU is the queen of process. The EU needs to simplify things because it needs to have loads of committees and member states and national parliaments sheep in on all this. So it really needs to have a single structure. The problem, and you could kind of say, okay, EU, you've got a point, you know, we want to simplify. And as Alexi was telling us, Switzerland has tried to be understanding and say, okay, we understand you need a simple structure. But here's the problem that both sides have. And this is why we're in such a, you know, coming back to the, the core question, Nicholas, is that mm, both Switzerland and Britain have had to face the temptation what I would call the temptation of asymmetric power, the eternal EU temptation of asymmetric prior. We have an EU in the world that has a lot of, you know, it's very insecure. It feels insecure. It has geopolitical solitude. It's hard to be the EU these days. It's been hard. Are we really an actor? Are we an actor, not an actor? What kind of actor, normative or this and that? But what does the EU have? One big thing, regulatory power, the trade regulatory nexus. It can be a regulatory hegemon in the world through the Brussels effect, but even more in the neighborhood and even more with two big economies, the Swiss and the Brits. The Swiss are the biggest trading partner of the EU, my God, you know, but still the EU is like, okay, you, we give you something we call privileged partnership, but you have the privilege of being bullied more than the rest of the world, if I can be a bit provocative. And so just very quickly, you know, we have the question you've already alluded to, Niklas, of the so-called parallelism that gives, you know, buttons of, of anger to the Brits, um, where the margin of interpretation in the dynamic alignment to EU rules, that's always what's at stake. You've got access in exchange for convergence, rights in exchange for obligations of being like us. And of course, the problem here in Switzerland has been at the forefront is the other side wants two things. It wants some margin of maneuver, some margin of interpretation, Switzerland and Britain. That's the very big thing right now in the British negotiation as in uh, how do we do state aid? We can come back to that, but let us do it our own way. And interestingly, and that's a very British kind of add on, we want more symmetry, mutuality, you want to influence us? Well, why can't we influence you? You want to have a say in our state aid approach? Well, we should have a say in yours. And in fact, that's kind of where we are now, but we're not quite there yet. In the temptation of power, when it goes really bad and when this whole kind of parallelism doesn't work or you know, where the, what goes with it, which is participation, you get access, but we, you know, we, we trade with you, but we, Switzerland or Britain, we participate in your decision-making to influence your rules if you don't give us enough margin of interpretation. That's really hard and complex for the EU. We understand that. So when all of this little package of access for convergence and participation, how this works to give margins of freedom to the other side, well, where do we have dispute settlement? As Alexi was saying, a big issue in the Swiss negotiation, a very big issue with the Brits, because every, everything that the Swiss side is a bit allergic to, the UK is super allergic to. So we have ECJ, uh, you know, the Swiss are accepting partial ECJ jurisdiction. The, the UK is like, no, 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 absolutely not, vampire. But then the EU is saying, well, at least what we want is to be able to flex our muscles, cross retaliation. And this is where the cautionary tale for Britain is perhaps one of the biggest sore point that what happened in Switz with Switzerland when the free movement was contested uh, with the referendum and, and, and when the EU said, OK, we retaliate somewhere else on financial services. That's called cross retaliation across sectors. And the Brits, you know what, they saw that <laughs> and they remember that. And they're like, whoa, we don't want this in the future. Like, we don't want you to have too much of a margin of cross retaliation like you did with the Swiss. Now the <coughs> Europeans are saying, well, come on, we're not that bad and we did it once, but we don't want to even do it to the Swiss again. But, you know, Britain is wary about this cross retaliation because it, it can see that this is where the EU can really exercise, you know, its power. 
So I'm, I'm, I, I, and, and, and of course, it's, it's the so-called guillotine clause in the, in the Swiss agreement. I'd love to hear Alexis and Nicholas more on this and anyone else in the, in, the, um, in, in the room. How do we think about this? How do we think of the EU granting unilateral equivalence and exercising power there? Because power, what is power? It's arbitrariness or perception of arbitrariness. And to the extent that the EU insists on equivalence it can be arbitrary. I mean, of course, it, it's fine to do equivalence. That's how you do it in financial services. But both Switzerland and Britain have a real stake, especially because they're two big financial centers, in questioning the way in which the EU, again, exercises that power. Um, is, does it exercise purely on regulatory grounds? You are kosher, your financial services are kosher, your capital adequacy ratio is kosher, whatever you want, or does it use it as an instrument of industrial policy to favor its own? Is it tempted to do that? That's again, the temptations of power. So I would say this is the challenges are both shared, but to different degrees between Switzerland and Britain today, Nikos. Uh, thank you so much, Kalip. So you were really like uh, brought us into the heart of uh, uh, the debate. But I would just very briefly want to ask you before I, we go then maybe into more details of what you said about guillotine clause, ECJ, and so on. Would you say, given that uh, Brussels or the European Union insisted on that parallelism uh, and insisted that there must be for every rights you get, there must be obligations, that it was a necessity in the end that Brexit was gonna be like a hard Brexit if it was going to make sense and that we're now only talking about the uh, FTA? Um, in, many of us said that analytically at the beginning um, that you know if you're gonna do the super costly thing that is called Brexit, which is different from not entering the EU as the Swiss, you know, it's about breaking ties and this is very costly, then you might as well uh, not get the worst of all worlds pay without say, which is kind of very much where Norway is. You know, in political theory, we call this domination. I mean, there is a great extent of domination. And so you might as well be actually free and benefit from your freedom, for instance, in new technologies. You know, the UK is hoping that at least in, say, AI, big data, certain area where the EU is not nimble enough and flexible enough to adapt, it might as maybe it will do better by developing new rules. There's also some some of this argument in finance. So um, I think it did make sense to some extent to say, well, if you're going to Brexit, you're going to Brexit for real. Some of us, I mean, I I felt very schizophrenic to to you know um, to be fair here. I, um, it's it's funny to say these words when you have many wonderful participants who are going to say, hmm. uh, but I did. I mean, I, I could make this reasoning in the abstract, but at the same time, I have been advocating, you know, as close a relation as possible because, and we'll get, get to that, because if you go, if you diverge too much, you know, how in 20 years time will my children, you know, try to bring Britain back into the EU? So, so I'm very schizophrenic about this question, Nicholas. Wonderful. Okay. Well, not wonderful that you feel schizophrenic, but like, thank you for uh, your answer. And I would like to go back to Alexis and maybe let's go now a bit more into the details of these negotiations. I mean, we said uh, the ECJ is an issue, you know, to what extent um, does the European Court of Justice have the competence to rule? Um, is that something that comes out or kind of dispute resolution comes up uh, in both negotiations, even though there might be a difference, you know, whether you are part or at least partially participating in a single mar market, or if you explicitly uh, are looking for a relationship outside the single market. Another question that now has uh, gotten even more prominence is like state aid, especially here in the UK. That's also one of the sticking points in the uh, institutional framework agreement. So maybe you can uh, walk us through these uh, the, the similarities and differences, Alexis, and if you also want to address Calypso's point of the, the guillotine clause. Did we lose Alexis maybe, or is he still around? Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. 
Okay. I, I was saying I, I loved um, Calypso's intervention, uh, particularly the, uh, the the idea um, of uh, of uh, of, uh, of the regulatory hegemon, which is which is absolutely true. Let me make maybe two or three um, two or three comments. Um, I think that one has to be a little bit careful when talking about cross retaliation and equivalence because I mean cross retaliation and also from an international uh, um, uh, contractual law point of view retaliation can be uh, applied if it's part of the system um, in, 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 in as a reaction um, to a damage uh, that has been created to another party. Um, in the specific case that the, the Swiss have been uh, experiencing, um, this was not a cross retaliation. Um, it was much worse. Uh, what happened is that um, the, the, the commission um, denied the rec recognition of the, the determination of equivalence in a, in a certain, um, in a certain uh, uh, Swiss regulatory sphere of, of the uh, of the exchanges, um, but equivalence <laughs> has been used, as the French would say, à tort et à travers. I mean, there is a a narrow definition of equivalence, and this is where the whole thing came from. The equivalence is the procedure applied by the Commission in certain legal acts in the area of financial services, mainly there where there is a third country provision. They have then said, we don't, we, we don't grant you the, the, the equivalence because you, you don't, you're not ready to conclude this agreement. Um, but I mean, this is nothing to do with the equivalence. Uh, I mean, they, they interpret, of course, the equivalence in a wider sense. And from that point of view, the experience with the UK now over the last three years has been very problematic because the, the, the equivalence has, has moved from a technical device to be applied in specific circumstances to a tool of trade policy. And um, I think this is, in, in, the, in the perception, particularly in the UK, equivalence is, 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 is a form of, 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 of bilateral cooperation. But this is not the case. I think one must really separate very, very neatly um, the, 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 these various concepts. The, the, the other point about the guillotine, um, I, I don't think that guillotine is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a mechanism that is used very often. In the specific case, uh, of the first package with, between Switzerland and the, and the, and the Union, um, the guillotine was invented because the, the Brussels was fearing that at some point the Swiss would vote down the freedom of movement, and hence that the whole balance of that package would 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 actually uh, fall apart. Um, and in a certain way, I mean, also in the internal debate in Switzerland, I, I mean, I, I I realize that I didn't make myself very very popular by saying that, but the existence of the guillotine has probably secured the, the, the survival of the first package. I mean, this, this, is the, this is the reality, you see. So, I mean, this is a, a device which had its logic in a system of direct democracy. I would probably say, uh, we go back to uh, Calypso in that case. Um, I mean, one thing that I've been wondering, I mean, you, you uh, wrote your book uh, titled uh, uh, Exodus uh, Reckoning Sacrifice. Would you say these concepts also apply in a certain way um, to this, or can we use these concepts to describe the Swiss uh, way or path or problem with the European Union? Or is it fundamentally different? Because as you say, it's not an exodus. It's actually kind of somebody who never really wanted to join. And maybe also expanding on that, do you think that the reasons for that Euroscepticism might be similar? I mean, is it like uh, 
I mean, is there something about, you know, democracy? Is there something about, um, in a way, kind of perceiving the European Union as an empire that both of these countries, despite having completely different uh, histories and cultures that they share? Now I see Alexis back, but now I already asked a, a question to, uh, to Calypso. Are you, can you hear us? And uh, yes, Alexi, I, I mean, uh, I, I, I think that Alexi, you know, your, um, your, your developments on, on equivalence is very, very important because um, this is the kind of um, slow drift. When you have power, you use it. And I've, I have asked, you know, commission officials, why are you drifting in this technical thing, equivalence, now using it as a trade instrument, even a, a, an industrial policy instrument? Uh, you know, that's kind of not right. That's not the spirit of it all. And they're like, and I've had an answer once very high up because we can. <laughs> and that's, you know, what you do when you can, you do. Um, but okay, be that as it may, um, uh, Nicholas just asked me very kindly referring to the book and any author will love to have a reference to their a plug, you know, and I just had a, I thought my book had been completely forgotten because it was published um, more than a year ago. And my God, we've had COVID since then. Nobody's interested in, in, in Brexit anymore, are they? But they are, and you are. Um, and it, apparently it's still the bestseller in Brussels these days. Um, and indeed, um, I haven't quite thought about this uh, exactly, but let me just give it a shot, Nicholas, because you, you really gave me the, the hint here. So what do e Exodus, each of those um, um, allusions to kind of mythical themes help us think about how the EU sees, sees Switzerland, Britain. So Exodus, yes, of course, in, Brit in the British case, it's let the people go, you know, to the land of milk and honey. I mean, the parallel is brilliant, but not, not you know, anyway, it works. But the underlying exodus is a double thing. It's the EU saying it's, it's your problem. You know, Moses, you want to leave Egypt and you're going to be in the desert and in the wilderness. It's your problem. Switzerland, you're in the desert and the wilderness. You're not part of it. It's your problem. So that's common. And what is common is also what is happening. Why? Be the sense of exceptionalism, you know, the chosen people. Now, Switzerland and Britain have very different ways of thinking of themselves as exceptional. In fact, there is nothing less exceptional than exceptionalism. Every country has its own variant of exceptionalism. But these two, you know, pretty rich country, pretty posh countries, you know, well off. A, sen a certain sense of superiority and we don't really need the other Europeans, but at the same time, a kind of basic decency, really good government, each a claim to have invented democracy or a version thereof, you know, Westminster democracy, direct democracy, whoa. And I'm like, hey, what about the Greeks here? But, you know, we, they came before. But anyway, so, and we could go on and on. So there is a kind of a variance on exceptionalism underlying the exodus and the question becomes for the EU can you can you accommodate exceptionalism both in your midst because if it had been able to do it for Britain would never had left um, and there will be more and more of this challenge and also at your margins and that's a great challenge for the EU but I would say you know in the book yes there is except exo ex um, exodus but the reckoning is, it, is clearly as important for both. Reckoning is about, no, no EU, don't say it's the Swiss problem, it's the British problem. It's your problem, there's some challenge there. And, and just after the vote, it was very present and then became forgotten. But I think, I mean, I mean the Brexit vote, but I think the Swiss are also in their own ways challenging the EU to come to a reckoning to see uncomfortable truth about its own process. I'm, you know, I'm for tough love. I'm a very pro-EU, I was Remain, et cetera, but I'm also very critical of the EU. And of course the EU has a problem with, the, with ownership, with democracy, with, with a sense of by its people that, that they have, that the EU belongs to them and they belong to the EU. And, and with facing some of the difficult questions like free movement, you know, the UK and the U and Switzerland are not the only ones to have 
problems with free movement when there is asymmetry of wealth, asymmetry of attractiveness. The EU was not conceived for that asymmetry with six countries at the beginning. And these, these problems are gonna come back and come back. And why isn't the EU capable of using UK, Switzerland as moments of reckoning? And finally, sacrifice is very important because in sacrifice, I note that isn't it interesting that the EU has been so united against Britain, one of, one of its own member states. The EU doesn't manage to be very united on China, on Sisi, on Erdogan, uh, or even on Trump. But, and maybe it's getting better now. But when it comes to dealing with a nice, friendly, like-minded country like Switzerland, like Britain, um, it is united and it's, so in a way, it, it, these countries are kind of sacrificed for the sake of unity and for the claiming of Europe's you know, integrity and its big principles. Um, and fair, fair enough. So I deconstruct this in the book, you know, what this, this kind of sacrifice. But I think that the, that the EU needs to be self-aware of this and needs to realize that at the end of the day, and I know you want to get to this, Niklas, you know, what, what, what would be a better approach? Maybe to consider Switzerland and Britain as, as trailblazers, as places where we can really experiment with fruitful external relations where we don't fall prey to the temptation of asymmetric power. Wonderful, thank you so much. So uh, I would also, it's now at seven o'clock and uh, I think uh, this is also a good time to uh, open the debate to the audience. If anybody does have a question, you can either write the question in the chat and I will read it out or you're also very welcome to raise your hand and then uh, one of the co-hosts will probably like let you in or uh, at the moment I don't see uh, any hands yet. So I would maybe give the floor quickly to Alexis to react on that, uh, you know, and it maybe expand on what Calypso just said about where do you, would you see like an optimal relationship? Where should uh, the Swiss EU relationship end? I, I'll try. Um, <laughs> Let me put forward one or two points um, because, I, because I, I was interrupted because of the of the system. Yes. Um, I think what is important uh, because this this legal dimension, the institutional dimension, comes up and again and again. I mean, what is very important for the two countries to understand is the distinction between full market access on the one hand and third party regime on the other. And uh, we've been trying to mix it, but in, in, in those areas where we are fully, where we fully access here, we have another, another institution and legal system. Just, it's, it's very, very important. I think that on the British side in a certain way, particularly from, I would say over the last two years, there was a sort of a, relatively clear position of sovereign versus market access and where sovereignty seemed to weight more than the market access. In the Swiss case, I think the Swiss are very pragmatic um, and they would in any case uh, put the priority on, on the pragmatism. But the, the other thing which I think is very, very important is that um, is what, what, what you said, uh, Calypso, which is so, so important, it's the, 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 the trade-off between convergence and, and di divergence in, from a regulatory point of view. I mean, this is really the key. And um, the Swiss, after the famous vote of 92, um, introduced an informal device um, that in any piece of proposed legislation, um, there must be a paragraph in case that that proposed legislation diverges significantly from the EU legislation. So there is a, a built-in in the system, a basic consensus about convergence, which is not identical, just convergent. I think this is extremely important uh, for, the, for the continued debate in Switzerland and in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the UK. It, and finally, I would like to make one comment, which I, for me is, is very, very, 
very important. I mean, I, I'm actually quite old, and I, I've been in the business since the beginning of the 70s. And the, 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 the external context in which we operated and we negotiated um, was very different from what we see now. We are not only thinking of the present American administration. I mean, the trend has started earlier than that, but of course, uh, the, the present administration hasn't helped. But the point is that what we are witnessing now are larger uh, aggregation of powers. And the, uh, an, an economy like the Swiss, even if the Swiss are very strong at all levels, um, it, it is a limited economy. And for the, for the UK, um, a country that I was partly brought up in, which I really know well, it, I mean, the, the UK is not much bigger from that point of view, for, in, in terms of the economic way. Um, it's, an, it's an illusion to believe that at a moment in which WTO is falling apart, that you can swim freely uh, on the, uh, in the open sea. I mean, I think the British will have to come to terms to some sort of cooperation with the Union and the Swiss will never, I mean, we have to even, if I compare what we've done over the last 20, 30 years, we'll probably have to come back and give in uh, as far as our sovereignty to a point, simply because we have to maximize our, our toolbox in terms of trade policy. I'll stop here. And with these words, we would like to thank all our speakers, Kalypso Nikolaidis, Alexis Lautenberg and Niklaus Nuschbrickel for the excellent talk and for the very interesting and informative discussion. Another big thank you goes out to Annalina for organizing most of tonight's evening. So thank you very much for that. And thank you all for joining us tonight. If you're interested in more, please visit our webpage, OxfordSwissSociety.com or like us on Facebook and see you very, very soon. Bye-bye.